This is Engineering Thermodynamics. My name is John Griffith. I'm your instructor. Brought to you from McNeese State University. Module 1A. Here we're going to talk about an overview of thermo, units of measurement, some basic physics concepts, and an introduction to properties. Thermodynamics deals with energy and its conversion into various forms and an accounting for energy so that we can account for the different forms of energy in various processes. There are two types of energy in motion. One is heat. That's energy moving from one place to another. Heat is thermal energy as you would find with a candle or a, or a heater, electric heater or solar energy, that sort of thing. Work is a higher form of energy, mechanical or electrical energy, which could be the moving of a piston up and down or electrical energy from a wall circuit. Uh, electrical energy can be converted completely into mechanical and vice versa, but that's not true for heat. Heat cannot be completely converted to work, and that's one of the important findings that we'll have in this course. Some of the early uses of thermo are to convert heat to work, such as with what we call a heat engine. Heat is converted, like for instance, if you heat up a piston cylinder arrangement, the piston will rise and thereby push back a load and give you some work from that. In the process of designing a heat engine, we'll have to put the energy through an intermediary. In the case of the piston cylinder, the fluid inside the the cylinder that's expanding is called the working fluid. So here we've got our working fluid guy. Put some energy into him and he'll burp. The working fluid converts energy by changing its properties. For instance, its volume will increase and by its volume increasing you'll get some work out of the system. Here's your working fluid. If you put heat in, then the weight will be lifted. Wood. A process, for instance, heat transformed into work is a result of a property change of a working fluid. For example, increasing your volume due, due to heating. A heat engine converts heat to hey, So we have a, an automobile engine, for instance, would take fuel, turn that into heat by burning it within the cylinders, then the cylinders, the gas remaining in the cylinders would expand, and you produce work. Every heat engine also has to give off some waste heat. You'll always find that you have some waste heat when you try to convert hot fuel, hot burned fuel into work. One of the first uh, uses of the heat engine or the steam engine was to use was to drive river boats up and down the river. Here's a more modern version. We have um, heat energy from the nuclear power plant to produce power. And what you see here are these little these are actually cooling towers that that uh, cool the condenser and that's where your heat gets lost to the surroundings. Again, every heat engine has to have some waste heat into the surroundings and in this case those that you usually see with nuclear plants, these large cooling towers that discharge heat into the surroundings in the way of in the way of steam vapor. Now I want to take a look at uh, fundamental units and look at units through uh, some basic laws of physics. First fundamental unit would be mass, and in the metric system or the SI system, we'd be looking at kilograms. In the English system, we'd call it pound mass. There's your fundamental unit, mass. Another fundamental unit is length, for instance, meters or feet. And finally, we have time as a fundamental unit, which is, is uh, seconds, pretty much, is the primary uh, unit that we use for time in both the English and the metric system, seconds. 
fundamental units can be converted, can be manipulated to form derived units. A derived unit would be something like velocity, the change in length over the change in time. So you'd have meters per second or feet per second would give you velocity. So a derived unit is one unit over another or times another. Another one is acceleration. If I take that velocity now, a derived unit, and divide it by time, then you have acceleration. So the change in velocity with respect to time is acceleration. And we could have meters per second squared or feet per second squared. Now you recall from physics that force is equal to mass times an acceleration. And we have our kilograms times a meter per second squared will form what we call a newton. Or a pound mass foot per second squared will give you a poundle. So a force is a mass times an acceleration and it forms its own new derived units. If we want to convert units, we use a conversion factor. And one of the most famous conversion factors is the what we call GC. GC is one pound force. Now because a a pound mass, and originally people thought, well, a pound force weighs a pound mass, or a pound mass weighs a pound force, but that's only true on Earth where the gravitational acceleration is 32 feet per second squared. So if you take a pound mass and put it through an acceleration of 32 feet per second squared, you'll get a pound force. Remember, a pound, a poundle was one pound mass feet per second squared, so a pound force is actually 32 poundles. So I use this conversion factor quite often, GC, which shows that one pound force, or that there are 32 pound mass feet per second squared per pound force. And you'll often have to use conversion factors to go from one form of a unit to another. Now we we'll look at some more physics concepts. Pressure is the force per area. Now remember, force was a kilogram meter per second squared. If, ta if we take a kilogram meter per second squared per the area, per meter squared, we have a pascal. So a kilogram per meter second squared would be a pascal. In the English system, we just take the pound force per inch squared, and that's what we call a PSI. Now we'll look at work. Work is our first form of energy. Work is energy. Mechanical work is a force times the distance. It's actually force times the distance that the force is put through in the direction of the force. So it's a dot product. Force dot distance is work. Has units of kilogram meters per second squared times the meter. So it's kilogram meters squared per second squared. You recall that's the joule. Or if we take a pound force and put it through a, f through a distance of one foot, that would be a, a foot pound. A foot pound force is also called a foot pound. And that again is a unit of energy. Now if we look at power, power is the work produced per time. So work per time is power. We'd have kilogram meter squared per second squared per second, or kilogram meter squared per second squared. A joule per second is a watt. In the English system, we'll have pound force feet per second squared, foot pounds per, I'm sorry, foot pounds per second. Wood! So Wood! Our, uh, <laughs> push ups. <laughs> There's his power. Power is how many of those you do per time. Other units of thermo are temperatures widely used because in thermo we're looking at the conversion of, say, heat energy to good mechanical energy, and we're talking about temperature quite a lot because that's how we'll measure a thermal energy. Thermal energy can have units of Kelvin in the metric system or Fahrenheit in the English system, degrees Fahrenheit. Now, technically, if it's a relative scale, you put the degree in front of it. If it's an absolute scale, you won't put the degree in front of it. So Kelvin is an absolute temperature. Fahrenheit is relative. Look at absolute and relative temperatures, and you have Kelvin 
I take Kelvin minus 273.15, I'll get the relative temperature of degrees Celsius. One you may not have heard of is the Rankine scale. In the English system of units, the Rankine scale is the absolute temperature. So a, a Rankine minus 459.6 will give you degrees Fahrenheit. So absolute zero is minus 273 degrees C in the Kelvin scale, or minus about 460 in the, in the uh, Fahrenheit scale. Another thing we use because energy responds to, and, and volume actually responds in a physical sense, more to moles than mass. So if I use the ideal gas equation, that's certain then uh, a mole of oxygen at similar conditions as nitrogen will take up the same space, although the mass will be different. So a mole is the mass divided by the molecular weight of the substance. And setting aside Avogadro's number, we can look at really just how many mass units there are per mole units. That's what I think of when I think of a kilogram mole or a pound mole. You can have a pound mole, you can have a gram mole. And as engineers, we look at that as the, again, the molecular weight is the mass units over the mole units. So the molecular weight of oxygen, for instance, would be 32 grams per gram mole. A pound mole of oxygen would weigh 32 pounds, or would have a mass of 32 pounds. A ton mole of oxygen would have, would have a mass of 32 tons. As we had relative temperature, we also have relative pressure. The relative pressure is usually measured with a gauge, so the gauge pressure would be the total pressure minus the atmospheric pressure. So here we have, for instance, PSIG. I like to use the example of your car. Say you have a flat tire. If your tire is flat, what's the pressure going to be? Zero. It's going to read zero on the gauge, but what's it really? It's really atmospheric pressure inside that tire. If it's completely flat, open to the atmosphere, through a hole, say, then you've got atmospheric pressure in there, which is about 14.7 psi, depending on the weather. But the grade gauge will read zero. So if your gauge reads, say, 32 psi, then you have to add back in the atmospheric pressure to get the absolute pressure. And when your gauge reads 32, the absolute pressure would really be more like what, 46, 46.7 about PSI. We would call that absolute pressure PSIA, and the gauge pressure we call PSIG. Okay, let's look at mechanical energy, forms of mechanical energy. One that we're familiar with from physics is kinetic energy. Kinetic meaning motion. Kinetic energy is the mass times V squared over 2. You see, again, that'll have kilogram meter squared per second squared, or joules. Potential energy is the energy from raising a weight, let's say. If you raise a weight up high, it has the potential to come back down and deliver some energy. And that energy is mass times g, that's the force, through the distance h. It'll give you, again, kilogram meter squared per second squared, or joules. Now this is one you probably haven't seen. If you take the units P times V, again you'll get joules. When you're putting a mass into a system, such as a chunk of mass here that we're trying to push into the system, it occupies a certain volume and it has a certain pressure. That pressure times volume is energy. To push that mass across the boundary of the system, you have to do work. And when it's coming out the other side, the system does work pushing it out. I call that flow work. So flow work is P times V, pressure times volume work, the work to get a, a mass into or, or out of a system. If you take force per area, that's pressure. Distance times area, that's volume. And you see you have a force times a distance. And you have work. Again, that's flow work. Now we'll look at extensive properties. Extensive properties depend on the amount of a substance. So 
things like volume or energy. I say, how much energy just is there in this container? Well, it depends on how much mass there is in the container. Same with energy. The more, more mass, the more volume. The more mass, the more energy. And we have intensive properties which don't depend on mass, such as temperature, pressure, viscosity. Actually, density would be independent of the mass. So we try to take, so that we can list these things in tables, we try to uh, get the mass out of there and we define what's called a specific property. We'll take the extensive property divided by the mass and we'll get a specific property which becomes intensive because we factored the mass out of it. So volume per mass will give us a small v, specific volume, small v, and energy per mass specific energy. Notice again that 1 over the volume, 1 over the specific volume would be rho, the density. Another concept that comes up quite a lot, and you'll see this, is um, specific gravity. I like to, um, you know, it gives you a, a quick, quick measurement or a quick idea of how dense the substance is. If I'd say the substance has a specific gravity of 1.5, that means it's 1.5 times the density of water. So something like an acid or, or mercury, say, very heavy, 13.8, I think is the specific gravity of mercury, 13.8 times the density of water. Whereas something like gasoline or the components of gasoline will be a lower density than water, so it'll have a specific gravity of on the order of 0 0.7, 0 0.8, something like that. Of course, gasoline, since it's not miscible in water, will float on the water because it's less dense than the water. And another famous uh, fluid that's less dense than water is ice. Once it becomes a, a solid form, it's less dense than water, so it actually floats above the water a little bit. That's the iceberg. Uh, another concept is the pressure of the fluid. The fluid pressure on the bottom of a tank, say, is the density times the times the acceleration of gravity times h, rho g h, we call that fluid head pressure. So fluid pressure at the bottom of the tank would be higher because of the weight of all the liquid on top of it. I want to define a couple of things. One is equilibrium, the definition of equilibrium. That's when the change of your properties of a substance with respect to position are not changing. There's no change in properties with respect to the position at a given time. So anywhere throughout the, say in a tank of fluid, anywhere, say the temperature is the same all through there. If the temperature is the same, we'd say it's in thermal equilibrium. Another concept is called steady state. In steady state, the properties don't change with time at a given p position. So say I start my engine in the morning. I start my engine and I, I drive down the road and I'm looking at my, my temperature sensor. And I notice the temperature is going up, going up, going up until I've been driving for a while. And then I, uh, I look down and it's not changing anymore. Now the temperature of the engine is the same at every given time. But if I take the temperature of the engine inside the engine, compare it to, say, the radiator, then it's changing with position. So the engine itself may not be in equilibrium, but it is operating at steady state. So there's two related concepts that aren't quite the same, equilibrium and steady state. And we'll do a lot with those later. And we want to talk about properties. Properties are what we call properties of a fluid, say the, the energy content or the, the volume. Those are what we call state functions. They do not depend on how you got there. If I tell you the volume is, or the specific volume, say, is one foot cube per pound mass, then it doesn't matter how I got there. That's what it is. So temperature and pressure, T1 and P1 going to T2 and P2, you'll see that the state of the system, if it's a pure substance, is fixed here at T1 and P1. And I go to T2 and P2, it's going to have a whole different set of properties here. 
but it really doesn't matter how I got there. So those are what we call state functions. Now Q, Q is the symbol we use for heat, and W, the symbol we use for work, those are what we call path functions. The heat that you put in to get from here to here could vary. I could get from T1 and P1 to T2 and P2 in a number of different ways. I could get there by maybe adding a little bit of heat and a lot of work, or maybe a little bit of work and a lot of heat. Multiple ways to get there, so we call that a path function. And processes are dependent on the path. It does depend on how you got there. So Q and W being energy and transit are path functions, whereas things like T and P are state functions. I want to talk about some these are words that will help you later. ISO. ISO means the same. Some ISO processes. If a process is isothermal, it occurred at the same temperature, constant temperature. Isochoric, constant volume. Isobaric, constant pressure. Often you'll see the, there's a unit of um, in the metric system called a bar, and that's a unit of pressure. It's close to an atmosphere. Isenthalpic. Now, enthalpy is one of our measures of energy. So, isenthalpic means it happened at constant enthalpy. Entropy is another thermodynamic property we'll talk about later. And isentropic occurred at constant entropy. So, finally, to recap what we've just done, we looked at some basic thermal concepts. Thermo using accounting to describe processes involving energy conversion, so we're really accounting for things. We're not looking at rates in thermo, how fast something happened, but how much usually. We're looking at how much with thermo, although we will put rate process in, into some of our calculations. And we also consider the concept that a working fluid is used to convert energy from one form to the other. So in a, in a power plant, often we'll use steam as the working fluid, or we'll use air as the working fluid to make energy go from one form to another, say from heat to work, or vice versa, from work, heat. We looked at units of measurement and considered that units are fundamental or units may be derived through some physical law. Some basic physical concepts, classical dynamics, force times distance, work, force equals ma, those sorts of things. And we also considered the concept of f times dx is equal to p times dv, a force through a distance the same as a pressure through a volume, or it gets you the same result, basically work or energy. So we also looked at an intro to properties intensive or extensive properties. Remember, intensive does not depend on the mass that's there. Extensive does. And remember, we took and divided the uh, extensive property by the mass to make it intensive. We looked at state functions. And we looked at equilibrium or steady state, those constants, and some ISO processes. So finally, we have your assignment. I want you to look at chapter 1, read chapter 1. And then two, the problems that, that you found in Blackboard, most of you have already gone to Blackboard and found those problems, start working those problems. It's really kind of a review of physics just to get you into the mode of working problems and checking your units and, and finding ways to, to do things. So that concludes this, this topic, and, and we'll move on from there.